very worried now. Um, so, um, I first came across Bitcoin about three or four years ago when I was writing an e-book about trying to make sense of why gold had come back from being completely dismissed by economists to suddenly being worth five times what it, what it had been at the bottom of the market. And someone said, you should look at this thing called Bitcoin. It's a kind of digital gold. And I looked into it a bit in the book and, um, and found that, I mean, it did fit into this idea of, of money as a form of religion in a way that, you know, you have to have faith in it. And people had lost faith in government money and had gone back to an old religion of gold. But it seemed to me Bitcoin was about a new faith in technology um, that is, I guess, the, the rival faith out there in the economy. And then in the following couple of years, Bitcoin went from about $3 a Bitcoin to 1200 and everyone heard about it and it seemed to be this great speculative currency. Uh, the Winklevi twins uh, invested in it, so it must be pretty mad. It was invented by this sort of person who no one knew who they were, whether they really existed, were they Google, were they the NSA, were they some insidious Chinese group or whatever. It was being used to buy drugs and prostitutes on Silk Road. Um, and had this sort of weird exchange called Mount Vox that seemed to be easy to dig into and wrestle money away from and went bust anyway and, and so forth. And it all seemed just like a complete mess, frankly. And we've all kind of, sometime last year, I think we all decided that Bitcoin wasn't going to be the future of money. We, we and, now, and, now, and now it's suddenly back. And then what's interesting is that people have, have actually looked beyond the money to to this underlying technology. And, and, and I think this idea of blockchain is really what we want to focus on here. We'll talk a bit about Bitcoin, but yeah. this current, this, Michael, why, why is this blockchain technology that Bitcoin is based upon, why is that creating so much excitement in the tech world at the moment? Well, a lot of technologists will think of it as a platform. Um, it, it, it's a platform on which you can build all sorts of things. And it's a special type of platform. It's a platform that's decentralized because what it allows is the exchange of value between two people remotely, between two strangers, two strangers, without the need for an intermediary. And this is critical because it, it goes against 500 years. The solution that we had for 500 years was we put banks in the middle of the exchange of value, or in other institutions, be they trustees or lawyers. And we needed them because we don't trust each other. Uh, and, and ultimately, we need someone to verify that I have this amount and that I'm sending it to this, this person that those balances will transfer. So this is a system, this blockchain system actually resolves a fundamental problem of trust. Um, and that platform can then be used to build all sorts of other applications. The first use case is, is currency, is Bitcoin. But there's fundamentally all sorts of things that can be built on that can take advantage of the fact that we no longer have to rely on these intermediaries. Now, Paul, I've been very struck by talking to people in Silicon Valley that um, you know, are programmers who really, you know, sort of, they, they live to program the, the sort of the kings of the nerds. I mean, and they essentially, I mean, they regard this blockchain as something of a holy grail, an equivalent to sort of Fermat's, solving Fermat's theorem in mathematics. And, I mean, what is it about it that, yeah. that seems so I think, important? And uh, just so everyone knows, this is, uh, this is my 360 degree camera. I wanted to record this. Session, we can know. be as geeky as we can be as geeky as uh, Greg else. has one just like it out on his table. So uh, the, the thing about it is, okay, basically, and Bitcoin is it's very mystifying, and it took us actually a very long time to get our heads around it and to understand it and actually be able to describe it to people and, and write a book about it. But I think ultimately, it's actually very simple. It is a piece of software. It's a program. It runs on a decentralized network of computers. And like you were just saying, like it allows people to exchange value of, of really anything. We'll get to that in a second. It allows people to exchange value directly between themselves without this third party. That's a very simple way to, to describe it. The implications of that are extremely profound. And the key feature, which is what you're, you're getting at, is this blockchain. What this is is... It is an open public ledger of every single transaction that is made under the, on this platform, which is called Bitcoin. Every single transaction is there, it is recorded, it is open for everyone to see, and it cannot be altered, it cannot be changed, it can't be hacked, the system itself can't be hacked, 
uh, wallets and services can be hacked, but the system itself can't be hacked. And what you build up is this inalterable ledger of transactions that is not controlled by any one person. So within that, you suddenly have this system that is a decentralized system that does the exact same thing faster and cheaper and open to more people than the centralized systems that we've had for a long time. And in Silicon Valley, if you go to Silicon Valley for any amount of time, everybody has a product that's gonna change the world. Every single thing that comes out of Silicon Valley is the greatest thing that's gonna change the world. Uh, Bitcoin, which may or may not have come out of Silicon Valley actually, uh, it really is one of these things that has the potential to change the world because it takes a lot of things we have been doing as best we can and it suddenly digitizes them and it puts them in a place where anyone can have access to them and that is profound. The fact that anybody anywhere in the world can suddenly access this system to the same degree that we can here. It, and and we'll, we'll talk about this in a second. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I mean it's a 30,000 foot big idea. It is really massive. Now look, we'll come back and talk about maybe some of the potential applications, but I wanted just to deal with some of the popular myths around Bitcoin, firstly. I mean, so this, this sense that it was uh, who invented by you know, maybe the NSA, maybe the Chinese government, maybe Google, maybe this weirdo called Satoshi. Right. Um, you know, what does that matter? Who invented it? Uh, do we uh, you know, know who it's, invented it? It's funny, it? it's funny. I walked up here today from our hotel and I stopped in at a coffee shop and the guy making coffee, he was on this, this real kick about this thing. He was asking everyone who comes in. He says, who invented television? I, I didn't know. Uh, everybody else who walked in didn't know. Uh, you don't know who invented television. Some of you probably do. You're very smart folks. But most people don't know who invented television. They don't care who invented television. Bitcoin, it doesn't really matter. The reason it matters so is it fascinates us. our money wouldn't be us. controlled by somebody right. else. Right. Your money is not controlled by this one person. Again, it's very important to understand this is a decentralized system. Okay, so it's not controlled by one person. Now, and then it involves all these people. I mean, the ones I know all seem to be Georgians who spend a lot of money <laughs> uh, mining. They're right. doing this thing called mining, which basically means burning up a load of energy on a computer, solving pointless math solutions in order to earn lumps of Bitcoin that you can then spend. I mean, does, does, right, is this is the thing that really uh, baffles people's minds. Um, look, it, 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 it is one of the challenges that it, there is an enormous amount of energy waste that's involved in it. But the reason that's there is because you have to, ha have to be able to do something in order to earn the seniorage. Seniorage is a, is a term that's used to describe the value that a currency issuer gains. So when governments issue currency, they have the right to print free money. How do you give somebody that right who is not a government who's earned it through you know, fiat power? Um, by participating in a network and giving something of value. What these guys do is they confirm the transactions. So the, the primary role that the miners do is actually to confirm transactions, to maintain the ledger, to make sure that everybody is playing by the book and that the system has integrity. But to incentivize them to do that, you've got to reward them with something. You reward them with fresh bitcoins that get issued by this ongoing algorithm. And the, the exercise that you undertake is you have to invest in something to do that. So the investment is in mining equipment, it's in energy, it's in, it's in electricity. And then on top of that, there's an incentive system that, that, to make it a free market. Everybody's racing each other to get there. So everyone's building the faster computers and putting in more energy. And it is a bit of an arms race. And it is a fundamental problem that needs to be addressed. And the fact of the matter is this is where we come down. We're not, you know, what they call Bitcoin maximalists who believe that the only possible cryptocurrency that could change the world is Bitcoin. It's our view that the underlying technology, the blockchain idea is really the important thing here because after all this is open software. So I just want to, uh, again, so, so, I mean, are you saying that therefore, you know, it's not going to be the currency that becomes the world currency? I mean, I, you know, one of the things that was appealing about Bitcoin and the sense in which it was similar to gold was that the money supply was right. preordained by the algorithm and therefore you couldn't have a government come in and print money willy-nilly and inflate and like people think, well, the record of governments is quite bad on that front. But I mean, so so you actually don't think that it's going to replace a, the dollar a, it's, or it's the it's one or the leap. euro or whatever? It's a huge leap to get there right now. I mean, and the, the number of people who are actually using Bitcoin for currency purposes is still very, very small because people feel comfortable with, with dollars. And, you know, the, the, the yeah, idea and the dollar, is... Even the dollar doesn't 
wildly swing between $3 right. and so the volatility of the price is, 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 is a problem, yeah. right? But to, to me, to focus on that, as, as I say, all of us in the media, to some extent, I think, have overly done so, is to miss the point of the, of the underlying power of this. And we act, I actually believe that we may get to the point where Bitcoin becomes kind of like the native currency of the internet, but before we get there, there's going to be a lot of other uses for it. The idea that you could actually take dollars, take tokens of a dollar, an IOU, and put that on the blockchain. And so that, that when I'm transferring to you, to your digital wallet, the other side of this, this blockchain transaction, something that you can sort of see recognizes itself being worth a dollar, that then allows for much, much faster transfers. In fact, that's where a lot of the money is being spent right now in terms of developing these alternative uses is on Wall Street. Okay, so one more thing before we come on to these potential other uses. I mean, all this, I mean, the, the current use seems to be you know, speculation plus, you know, doing dodgy deals with drugs and, and prostitutes on the dark internet. Well, so that's, look, look, that's something that's going to happen. Uh, that really happens. A lot of these technologies, they end up being adopted on the outskirts, on the fringes. The, the, the important thing is about this, and it's funny because you talk about uh, synapses firing. When Casey, when Casey was talking, he had talked about there being no gatekeepers anymore. That was your, your quote about being no gatekeepers. Bitcoin and this system, when we talk about a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer system, that is what we are talking about. This is a system that takes that gatekeeper role and just completely makes it redundant and unnecessary. You don't need to have somebody standing in the middle of your transactions for them to be recorded and for them to be valuable and for them to be in this permanent record. That is something that is going to take people a very long time to figure out the best use of it. But when they do, it just it opens up entire worlds that we have not had before. It puts a power into people's hands that they really have not had and which has been concentrated in a very small group of people who have had a tendency over the years to abuse that power. So that is the real sort of magic behind this. So Mike, we met a couple of weeks ago at a summit um, on, on the blockchain where Hernando de Soto, the economist who I think has most clearly articulated how capitalism can work to help the poor. Um, you know, he, he, became, he has become very enthusiastic about the use the blockchain might have to basically redefine how we um, enforce property rights for the poor and, for, and, and, and actually for everybody. I mean, that's one of the potential uses. I mean, tell, tell us a bit more about some of the other visions that you have for how the blockchain could be used to change things like our legal system, our right. financial system, and so Sure, forth. sure. There's, there's loads. Um, First, on that, on that property rights idea, just to, to focus again, because Casey's inspiring speech got me thinking about it as well. And he talked about the idea that every, you know, that entrepreneurs are everywhere, and that we are all becoming entrepreneurs. Well, this is actually an under De Soto's great revelation: is that we tend to think of the poor. You know, the Marxist conception of the poor was that they are the workers, right? Well, the reality is, amongst the informal economy of the developing world, the vast majority of these people are actually small entrepreneurs, and they struggle against their capacity to build wealth often because they don't have the capacity to exercise their property rights. So the idea that you could take the title to land or let's say title to their street vendor's cart and place that onto the blockchain so you have a permanent record of what it is and then a lender can come in and recognize that you actually own this asset because it's registered there on this permanent record that nobody can change because it's an irrefutable ledger that resides everywhere. A lender can then lend against that rather than you know, the, not knowing whether you're going to be good for your money. And that's an empowering thing that we've all taken for granted in the way that we get mortgages and so forth here. To then leapfrog it, technologies into these places and use this as a way to do that is one of the most powerful use cases. It's interesting you mentioned the developing world because, you know, I, I interviewed Bill Gates earlier this year about this and said, are you getting into Bitcoin? And he said, well, no, I'm not going to be bailing all the people out in Mount Gox, but I am using some of the underlying technology to do payment systems, remittances to the developing yeah. world. I mean, is that is that where you see it's, most of the action it's, that's it's going to happen? The, the, re, the remittance business, and again, it's interesting. A lot of this is, you have to keep in mind, all of this is experimental. Uh, what we're talking about with Hernando de Soto, and all these things, they're experimental. Even using it as a currency is experimental, but the currency is the first use case that has actually shown that it can work. And uh, there was a period in 2013 when people started to realize that you could use Bitcoin to cheapen the cost of the remittance business. And it was like a wildfire when people realized that this could actually happen. And you had a lot of pushback against that because people said, oh, you know, emerging markets, their image is, is the third world of Bush, people that have absolutely no, you know, no access to technology. No, and they said, no, that can't work. 
But it can, it actually can work. One, because that parochial view is just flat out wrong. The other, because uh, mobile technology is really a big deal in the, in, the, in the emerging markets. A lot of people have cell phones, a lot of people have access to them, and when you can take that technology, a cell phone, a mobile phone, and marry it with a remittance system that is based on Bitcoin, you suddenly have a much cheaper, cheaper system and uh, there's a lot of people that are trying to build this. The one I think is the most interesting is BitPesa in Kenya. Uh, Elizabeth Rosiello is just a brilliant person, and she's really doing it. She's doing it the smart way. She's really building it on the ground, trying to build out corridors. Uh, this is something that has just unbelievable ramifications. You're talking about basically 2 billion people that have not had access to financial services or have only had them under really onerous conditions. The costs have been so high. Suddenly, you have a very affordable system that can reach hundreds of millions of people. And it's interesting too, you know, Ethan was talking about his, his cook stove generating power for these cell phones. That's one of the problems is maybe you have a cell phone, but you don't have access to the power. Well, now you've got that, that cook stove, you have a cell phone, you have Bitcoin. You, you suddenly have a very different world in the emerging markets. So first thing, Michael, I mean, how soon before this becomes a major disruptive element in the developing world and then secondly you know what about us if, it's, if we're not going to be trading in our dollars for bitcoin what's going to be the first consumer application or the, or the main okay. first industry to be affected here in the united states and i'm going to throw it third just if i can wrap it into it yeah. but the first in the developing world i think that actually remittances are going to happen and the way it's going to happen is that they're coming up with technologies that will control the volatility that's the key concern for bitcoin because from when you go from dollars to pesos, at some point, how are you going to make sure that the Bitcoin in the middle hasn't changed the price and you can guarantee that your mother in Guadalajara still has the same amount you were going to send her? Well, they've got various hedging tools and a whole range of other techniques now that look like they're going to be able to contain the volatility and ma maintain it in the original price of the currency that you wanted. As for consumer use cases, and this is the key distinction I'm going to make, consumer use case here in the US, um, I actually think it's going to come out of left field, and one area might be the Internet of Things, so this idea that all of our gadgets in the world are going to be uh, connected in some way, our, uh, our washing machine will be able to automatically talk to uh, a maintenance uh, tr automated truck that comes and fixes your washing machine. That's a whole, if we imagine that world, we've got billions of gadgets all connected and talking to each other and actually entering into contracts and transactions with each other. They're going to need a secure, decentralized system for doing that because they have to trust each other. So there's this idea that the Internet of Things is going to be connected through some sort of Bitcoin-like mechanism with micropayments being passed back and forth between them. So that may be one consumer use case. So it's like Uber, Uber, Uber for fridges. Uber for fridges. That could be one way to describe it. The only third one I was going to point out is we won't necessarily think about this because we don't really think about the plumbing or the workings of Wall Street. But the biggest, the, the most amount of energy that's being placed and probably the most amount of dollars as well into blockchain solutions right now is in the settlement of securities within Wall Street. So right now, Wall Street operates on somewhere between a T plus two or a T plus three time frame. That's trade plus two days or trade plus three days. You enter into a trade, you execute your, your order of a certain amount of stock, it takes two days or longer for the, actually the money and the securities to change hands. The beauty of the automated blockchain transfer system is that you can place into a Bitcoin transaction a record of the security, a digitalized version of the security, and a digitalized version of the dollar or the dollars they're using, and exchange them. And the system will recognize that ownership has, take, has, has exchanged. That is going to take possibly trillions of dollars off the table that is left in abeyance for that for that waiting time and, and unleash that money in, in, in a powerful and how, way. And how soon is this really going to be making a difference? Uh, cool. it's, it's going to take a few years, I think. It's, it's Again, it's at a very early stage right now. They're starting to build these. I think it's going to be a few years. But what's going to be really interesting over these next few years, you're going to see this. The, the central friction of our time is not going to be left versus right, Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals, emerging world versus developing world. The central friction of the next three, five, ten years is going to be centralized versus decentralized systems. Bitcoin is a decentralized system. They are going to build others on top of it, and they are all going to put a lot of pressure on centralized systems well, these, to respond. These two gentlemen have written a terrific book. Um, please read it, because I think it is... Uh, some, some people like to say that Bitcoin's entered the boring phase, but in fact, I think it's entered the most exciting phase, and we're going to hear a lot more about the blockchain. So thank you very much, guys. For thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you.